Analysis of Section 132, quote, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts they shall heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, end of quote. That's in Second Timothy. Quote, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Galatians 1, 8, 9. In previous posts, I pointed to historical documentation that indicates that originally the revelation known, now known as section 132, was much shorter and only about restoring the biblical principle of patriarchal polygamy. It was apparently some time later that the te theological portions pertaining to the spiritual wife doctrine were added. I've already put my two cents worth about how I feel about the spiritual wife doctrine in another post. If you've not read it, you may view it here. And then there's a link, of course. I have, however, felt for a long time that since section 132 claims that after a person becomes aware of the doctrine contained therein, that they need to live it, and have multiple wives in order to receive the highest glory of the Lord. And since it's included in the four standard works and is presented by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as a true revelation containing true doctrine, that I'm compelled to take it very seriously and weigh it, weigh it in the balance against the other revelations contained in the four standard works. So I finally took the time the other night to read the entire section through again and to scrutinize each and every verse to see just how congruent this revelation is with the rest of God's revealed word. As usual, I was not able to take as much time as I desired, and this article, like most of the ones I have written, will remain a work in progress. Joseph Smith has informed us that true revelations never contradict previous ones. That one key should raise a big red flag when one reads section 132. The prophet Joseph Smith once made the following comment, quote, There have also been ministering angels in the church which were of Satan appearing as an angel of light. Parentheses gives an example. End of parentheses. Many true things were spoken by this personage, and many things that were false. How it may be asked, Was this known to be a bad angel? By the color of his hair. That is one of the signs that he can be known by and by his contradicting a former revelation. And that's in Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith. There are doctrinal sophists that will look at you with a straight face and tell you that the spiritual wife doctrine contained in section 132 does not contradict celestial law contained in section 42, or the command to limit yourself to one wife in section 49. But each of us need to determine the truthfulness of that teaching for ourselves. One of the truly disturbing things about the so-called revelation contained in section 132 is how it redefines so many of the plain and simple doctrines and phrases of the gospel that are contained in the Bible, Book of Mormon, and Doctrine and Covenants. Here are some of the terms and doctrines that seem to be redefined in this section. New and Everlasting Covenant, Oath and Covenant, Straight Gate. My concern is that redefining terms and doctrines previously defined by God and His holy prophets constitute the preaching of a different gospel. This is something else we need to keep in mind as we review this section. Here's my analysis of how the doctrines in section 132 measure up to the holy and infallible word of God. Section 132 is in black. My comments and observations are in red. So when I'm reading this to you, I'll read all of the black without saying anything, and then I'll say this is in red for the red part. Okay, section 132. Quote, Verily thus saith the Lord unto you, my servant Joseph, that inasmuch as you have inquired of my hand to know and understand wherein I, the Lord, justified my servants Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as also Moses, David, and Solomon, my servants, as touching the principle and doctrine of their having many wives and concubines. Okay, this is in red. Verse 1 is a big red flag in my opinion. It would have us believe that the revelation came as a result of Joseph Smith asking, or Joseph Smith asking on behalf of one of the elders of Israel, the Lord to explain why he had justified, among others, David and Solomon in having multiple wives. The Book of Mormon had already revealed that David and Solomon were not justified in having many wives and concubines. Did Joseph Smith believe the Book of Mormon? that he had brought forth by the gift and power of God? Of course he did. 
Why would Joseph Smith, as the seer of the Lord, who translated the Book of Mormon, be asking why God justified David and Solomon in taking multiple wives, when in fact it was through his efforts in translating the Book of Mormon that he was able to reveal to the world that David and Solomon were not justified in having multiple wives? Quote, For behold, thus saith the Lord, this people begin to wax in iniquity. They understand not the scriptures, for they seek to excuse themselves in committing whoredoms because of the things which were written concerning David and Solomon his son. Behold, David and Solomon truly had many wives and concubines, which thing was abominable before me, saith the Lord. End of quote. Not only does the Book of Mormon clarify that David and Solomon were not justified, it declares that what they did was an abomination. It reveals that those who used the scriptures to justify their actions in practicing polygamy did not understand the scriptures. It's almost inconceivable that the Lord anointed, the Lord's anointed, would ask such an unsound question of the Lord when he had already been an instrument in the hands of God to shed light on this issue. If the question would have been limited to asking why Abraham and Jacob and the righteous patriarchs that lived the principle were justified, there would have been no inconsistency and it would have been a sound and valid question. I have a little more to say about the ramifications pertaining to this most disturbing opening verse, but I'm going to come back to this later in the article after we review more of this section. Okay, this is in black. Quote, Behold and lo, I am the Lord thy God, and will answer thee as touching this matter. Therefore prepare thy heart to receive and obey the instructions which I am about to give unto you. For all those who have this law revealed unto them must obey the same. Okay, comments by Watcher in red. Common sense and a literal rendering of these verses up to the word you would indicate that if this really was a true revelation, the commandment to live this law is being given directly to Joseph Smith exclusively at this point, and that others would need to have a direct revelation from God or a tap on the shoulder from God's anointed in order to be justified in practicing it. And that appears to be what it is saying until you get to the last sentence, which actually makes the living of the law binding on everyone that reads the revelation or has it explained to them. Quote, For all those who have this law revealed unto them must obey the same. End of quote. Would God really do that? Would he take a so-called, quote, higher law, end of quote, and make it binding on virtually everyone who becomes aware of it? This brings up a very important issue. If God really did reveal this revelation to Joseph Smith, and if it was a valid, accurate revelation, why didn't God instruct Joseph to canonize it into the DNC? Did you realize that Joseph was getting ready to publish a new version of the DNC just before his death that contained about six or eight new additional revelations, but he did not intend to include this one? Why? When the new version of the scriptures that Joseph Smith prepared came out, they contained section 124, which warned the saints that anything more or less than what was in the Book of Mormon and the published revelations up to section 124 and any others that Joseph had published and made public, quote, cometh of evil and shall be attended with cursings, end of quote. See section 124. According to that ominous warning, uh, section 132 must be considered evil and it is attended with cursings. One only needs to read the diaries of the saints who struggle to live polygamy to get a glimpse of the cursings God warned the saints about. So if God did not commission Joseph or Hiram, who was actually the sole prophet of the church at the time of the martyrdom, to legitimize and canonize the current version of section 132, even though it had supposedly been given by then, who gave Brigham Young the authority to replace the article on marriage, which forbids the practice of polygamy, and replace it with section 132? If Brigham really was authorized by God to insert it, why did he have Brigham wait nearly 30 years to do it instead of having him do it when the saints reached Utah? Brigham openly stated numerous times that he had never seen God, nor did he claim to be a prophet. So where did he get the authority to canonize a revelation that binds the saints to the strange and contradictory doctrines found in this section? The insertion of section 132 without authority from God and without the law of common consent, is not very consistent with previous protocol. It contradicts previous revelations, and it neglects some kind of requirement of righteousness or justification through grace with regard to the promises of eternal life that it makes, 
Those promises of eternal life are solely predicated upon the acceptance of a strange and unnatural marital law. It neglects the law of common consent. It opens up the practicing of this law to everyone, not just the church membership. According to, see, accordingly, according the bill to William Law, the original revelation limited the practice of this law to high priests. Okay, now here's another verse in section 132, verse 4, in black. For behold, I reveal unto you a new and everlasting covenant, and if ye abide not that covenant, then ye are damned. For no one can reject this covenant and be permitted to enter into my glory. Okay, watcher's response in red. This is the first of several sacred gospel terms that this revelation redefines. Prior to this revelation, the phrase, quote, new and everlasting covenant, quote, always had to specific reference to the saving ordinance of the baptism of water, fire, and the Holy Ghost, which is the sacred covenant that gets us through the gate and onto the straight path. It sometimes also includes the messenger holding the keys to the saving ordinance of water, fire, and the Holy Ghost. Now, for the first time in the four standard works, the phrase is redefined to refer to a commandment to have multiple wives. Frankly, it seems blasphemous to me to redefine the new and everlasting covenant of baptism and the power of the atonement as referring to a mandatory requirement to have multiple wives sealed to you. I wonder how God feels about diverting the attention from the sacrifice and atonement of his son to the principle of polygamy. Would God really confuse us this way, especially since the law of the gospel contained in section 42 requires monogamy? This is not only redefining a term. It's reversing the meaning of the term. So I don't think so. Section 42 and section 132 cannot both be true because they contradict each other. The law of the gospel in section 42 is sacred to me. The spirit bears witness that it is true. I'm forced to accept one revelation or the other. They can't contradict each other and both be true. Okay, in black, starting at verse 5 in section 132, for all who will have a blessing at my hands shall abide the law which was appointed for that blessing, and the conditions thereof, as were instituted from before the foundation of the world. Verse 6, And as pertaining to the new and everlasting covenant, it was instituted for the fullness of my glory, and he that receiveth the fullness thereof must and shall abide the law, or he shall be damned, saith the Lord. End of quote. Okay, now we're in the red comments by Watcher. Okay, this revelation is now revealing that the only people who can receive a fullness of God's glory are those that enter into this new definition of what the new and everlasting covenant is, requiring multiple wives. The fullness of God's glory was addressed long before section 132 was crafted. Those crafting it should have studied section 76 a little closer because it addresses this issue. Apparently, Joseph and Sid were not aware of this new doctrine in section 132, when they experienced the vision now known as section 76, because they actually received a fullness of the glory of God while living monogamy in the flesh. Please notice the following verses. Quote, we, Joseph Smith Jr. and Sidney Rigdon, being in the Spirit on the 16th day of February, in the year of our Lord, 1832, by the power of the Spirit, our eyes were opened and our understandings were enlightened, so as to see and understand the things of God. Even those things which were from the beginning of the world was, which were ordained of the Father, through his only begotten Son, who was in the bosom of the Father, even from the beginning, of whom we bear record, and the record which we bear is the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, who is the Son, whom we saw and with whom we conversed in the heavenly vision. And while we meditated upon these things, the Lord touched the eyes of our understandings, and they were opened, and the glory of the Lord shone round about. And we beheld the glory of the Son on the right hand of the Father, and received of his fullness and saw the holy angels and them who are sanctified before his throne worshiping god and the lamb who worshiped him forever and ever and now after the many testimonies which have been given of him this is the testimony last of all which we give of him that he lives for we saw him even on the right hand of god and we heard the voice bearing record that he is the only begotten of the father end of quote not only did these two monogamous experience the fullness of the glory of God in the flesh, they revealed that all those who receive the testimony of Jesus and are baptized and keep the commandments, which are detailed in the law of the gospel, which is section 42, and overcome by faith and are sealed up by the Holy Spirit of promise, 
will be made kings and priests and will receive of his fullness and glory. Clearly, Joseph and Sidney received of his fullness as monogamists. Furthermore, section 76 explains exactly what the gospel of Christ is that enables us to enter into the fullness of his glory for eternity. Please note the following passages, quote, And again we bear record, for we saw and heard, and this is the testimony of the gospel of Christ, concerning them who shall come forth in the resurrection of the just. They are they who received the testimony of Jesus, and believed on his name, and were baptized after the manner of his burial, being buried in the water in his name, and this according to the commandment which he has given, that by keeping the commandments they might be washed and cleansed from all their sins, and receive the Holy Spirit by the laying on of the hands of him who is ordained and sealed unto this power, and who overcometh by faith, and are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, which the Father sheds forth upon all those who are just and true. They are they who are the church of the firstborn. They are they who are who, into whose hands the Father has given all things. They are they who are priests and kings, who have received of his fullness and of his glory. End of quote. I didn't notice anything in there about multiple wives being a requirement to receive the fullness of God's glory, did you? Is it possible that section 132 is preaching another gospel? Okay, now we're in the black, which is uh, section 132, verse 7. And verily I say unto you, that the conditions of this law are these, all covenants, contracts, bonds, obligations, oaths, vows, performances, connections, associations, or expectations, that are not made and entered into and sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise of him who is anointed both as well for time and for all eternity, and that too most holy by revelation and commandment through the meeting of my anointed, whom I have appointed on the earth to hold this power, and I have appointed unto my servant Joseph to hold this power in the last days. And there is never but one on the earth at a time on whom this power and the keys of this priesthood are conferred, are of no efficacy, virtue, or force in and after the resurrection from the dead. For all contracts that are not made unto this end have an end when men are dead. Behold, mine house is a house of order, saith the Lord God, and not a house of confusion. End of quote. Now we're in the red, watcher's response. I'm glad to know that God's house is a house of order, and not a house of confusion. However, now I'm really confused. This revelation is stating that the priesthood power to seal someone up according to the Holy Spirit of promise is never held by more than one person on the earth at a time. First of all, the Holy Spirit of promise can seal anyone up that the Father chooses. The Holy Spirit of promise does not function under the direction of mortal man. We will get more into this in a minute, but for right now, let's talk about priesthood keys. Apparently, the people who crafted this revelation neglected to read section 68 and 124. Let's review them. Speaking to several brethren who had been ordained to the office of high priest, the Lord gives this promise, quote, And of as many as the Father shall bear record, to you shall be given power to seal them up unto eternal life. Amen. End of quote. That's section 68. In addition to the incredible promise given above, which was given to several high priests and undoubtedly applies to the 144,000 high priests when they begin their ministry, section 124 makes it abundantly clear that in 1841, Joseph and Hiram both held the power to seal people up in conjunction with the Holy Spirit of promise, based on providing the ordinances of salvation. Furthermore, section 81 tells us that the three people that compose the first presidency of the high priesthood jointly hold the keys of the kingdom. Do I now have to throw out sections 45, 68, 76, 81, and 124 in order to embrace this new gospel that's being preached in section 132? The problem for 7, however, is much deeper than that. In verse 5 and again in verse 7, section 132 introduces the law of conditions pertaining to salvation in the highest kingdom. Or in other words, it lays the foundation for what the conditions of the gospel and the conditions of salvation are. At this point in my critique of this section, I'm going to submit the glorious discourse that King Benjamin gave regarding the conditions of the gospel. I challenge you to read Mosiah 4, 8 and ponder the fact that this righteous king had just delivered a message to his people that he'd received from an angel. Then in verse 8, he then outlines what the conditions of salvation really are. 
I challenge you to read Mosiah chapters 2, 3, and 4 and make bullet points of what the conditions of salvation are and what they are not, and then make bullet points based on what section 132 claims the condition of salvation are. You'll be shocked. Section 132 gives entirely different and contrary conditions that King Benjamin gives. Section 132 preaches quite a different gospel than the Book of Mormon preaches. The Book of Mormon tells us to put our faith and trust in God and the Atonement. Section 132 teaches us to put our faith and trust in human priesthood authority. The Book of Mormon has God bestowing the Holy Spirit of promise on his children. Section 132 emphasizes that God only has one man on the earth at a time that has the authority to seal you up by the Holy Spirit of promise. The four standard works teach that the Holy Spirit of promise works under the direction of the Father and the Son and independent of man. Yet section 132 claims that you can only receive the Holy Spirit of promise through the special person who is anointed to give it. The Book of Mormon states in no uncertain terms, quote, The keeper of the gate is the Holy One of Israel, and he employeth no servant there. And there is no other way save it be by the gate, for he cannot be deceived, for the Lord God is his name. End of quote. Do a keyword search on the four standards works to see what Paul and others taught about the Holy Spirit of promise and see if the associated doctrines point you to putting your trust in God or human priesthood authority. After doing so and after comparing the words of King Benjamin to the strange new doctrine found in section 132, you'll get an incredible clarity on how section 132 differs from the gospel taught in the true word of God. Okay, now in black. Section 132, continuing in verse 9. Will I accept of an offering, saith the Lord, that is not made in my name? Or will I receive at your hands that which I have not appointed? And will I appoint unto you, saith the Lord, except it be by law, even as I and my Father ordained unto you before the world was? I am the Lord thy God, and I give unto you this commandment, that no man shall come unto the Father but by me or by my word, which is my law saith the Lord, end of quote. Okay, now we're in the red response by Watcher. Why is the Lord making specific reference to his new law contained in this proposed revelation as the conflicting law contained in section 42 had never been given? Why didn't he mention his law, which he had already given, which his, this new law contradicts? Has it been done away with? If so, why doesn't the Lord notify Joseph Smith that a higher or lower law is being instituted, just as the Lord notified Moses when the lesser law containing the carnal commandments was being instituted instead of the higher one? See Joseph Smith translation, Exodus 34. This is very confusing and not congruent with previous revelations and commandments. Okay, now we're back to section 132, verse 13. And everything that is in the world whether it be ordained of men by thrones or principalities or powers or things of name, whatsoever they may be, that are not by me or my word, saith the Lord, shall be thrown down and shall not remain after men are dead, neither in nor after the resurrection, saith the Lord your God. For whatsoever things remain are by me, and whatsoever things are not by me shall be shaken and destroyed. Therefore, if a man marry him a wife in the world, and he marry her not by me, nor by my word, and he covenant with her so long as he is in the world, and she with him, their covenant and marriage are not in force when they are dead. And when they are out of the world, therefore they are not bound by any law when they are out of the world. Therefore, when they are out of the world, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are appointed angels in heaven, which angels are ministering servants to minister for those who are worthy of a far more and an exceeding and an eternal way of glory. End of quote. Okay, this is Watcher's response in red. I don't see any major discrepancies in those passages. Perhaps they were taken from a valid revelation, or perhaps those that crafted this revelation just got lucky, or perhaps Old Scratch throws in a little truth to give credibility to the lies he's perpetuating. Okay, now um, in black... Uh, from section 132, starting in verse 17. For these angels did not abide my law, therefore they cannot be enlarged, but remain separately and singly, without exaltation, in their saved condition, to all eternity, and from henceforth are not gods, but are angels of God forever and ever. End of quote. Okay, Watcher's response in red. I'm not positive, because I've not taken the time to do an extensive keyword search, 
but I believe this is the first time in the four standard works that the word exaltation is used in this context. Prior to this, when used in a pro positive context, it simply means raised up. I think that possibly the word saved categorically meant saved in the highest degree, the highest kingdom of God in the New Testament and the Book of Mormon. The word salvation also categorically referred to being saved in the celestial kingdom in the DNC until section 76 was received. It was then for the first time that the word saved was used to refer to a saved condition in any kingdom of glory, but the broader use of the word was clearly spelled out in that revelation. I believe section 132 introduces exaltation theology for the first time. Why is this important? It may not be. I don't necessarily see a problem with using the word exaltation in place of salvation. However, it's curious that God would never introduce this term until now, particularly when it would have been so appropriate in section 76, if in fact it is an accurate descriptive. The exaltation doctrine in 132 possibly creates a necessity for multiple kingdoms within the celestial kingdom based on number of wives, etc. Hence the misinterpretation of section 131, 1 through 4, by many people. Yet the scriptures are so clear about the fact that there are three kingdoms of glory and that all of the elect that go to the highest kingdom are equal, having received the fullness of the Father. It's interesting how the Lord warns leaders of the restoration movement to not exalt themselves. Notice how the Lord uses the word exalt when telling Satan what he was thinking in his heart. Quote, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. End of quote. That's Isaiah 14. Okay, back to section 132, verse 18. And again, verily I say unto you, if a man marry a wife and make a covenant with her for time and all eternity, if that covenant is not by me or by my word, which is my law, and is not sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise through him whom I have anointed and appointed unto this power, then it is not valid neither of force when they are out of the world, because out of this world, because they are not joined by me, saith the Lord, neither by my word. When they are out of the world, it cannot be received there because the angels and the gods are appointed there, by whom they cannot pass. They cannot, therefore, inherit my glory. For my house is a house of order, saith the Lord God. Verse 19, and again, verily I say unto you, If a man marry a wife by my word, which is my law, and by the new and everlasting covenant, and it is sealed unto them by the Holy Spirit of promise, by him who is anointed, and to whom I have anointed this power and the keys of the priesthood, and it shall be said unto them, Ye shall come forth in the first resurrection. And if it be after the first resurrection, in the next resurrection, and shall inherit thrones, kingdoms, principalities, and powers, and dominions, all heights and depths, then shall it be written in the Lamb's book of life, that he shall commit no murder whereby to shed innocent blood. And if ye abide in my covenant, and commit no murder whereby to shed innocent blood, it shall be done unto them in all things whatsoever my servant hath put upon them, in time and throughout all eternity and shall be of full force when they are out of the world. And they shall pass by the angels and the gods which are set there to their exaltation and glory in all things, as hath been sealed upon their heads, which glory shall be of fullness and a continuation of the seeds forever and ever. Verse 20, Then shall they be gods, because they have no end. Therefore they be from everlasting to everlasting, because they continue. Then shall they be above all, because all things are subject unto them. Then shall they be gods, because they have all power, and the angels are subject unto them. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye abide my law, ye cannot attain to this glory. For straight is the gate, and narrow the way, that leadeth unto the exaltation and continuation of the lives, and few there be that find it, because ye receive me not in the world, neither do ye know me. End of quote. Now this is in the red response by Watcher. Now, section 132 is redefining the phrase, straight is the gate and narrow the way. Let's do a keyword search to see if the new definition squares with the original definition given by Christ. Quote, Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Enter ye in at the gate, straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way which leadeth to destruction, and many there be who go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, 
and few there be that find it. And that's Matthew 7. It's interesting that Christ first introduces the term straight gate in the Sermon on the Mount after telling his followers to treat people the same way they would want to be treated. The implication is that his followers already knew what the phrase straight gate had reference to. Now let's see what the prophets understood about the phrase Christ was using. Wherefore, do the things which I have told you I have seen that your Lord and your Redeemer should do. For for this cause have they been shown unto me, that ye might know the gate by which he should enter. For the gate by which he should enter is repentance and baptism by water. And then cometh the remission of your sins by fire and by the Holy Ghost. And then are ye in the straight and narrow path which leads to eternal life. Yea, ye have entered in by the gate. Ye have done according to the commandments of the Father and the Son. And ye have received the Holy Ghost, which witnesses of the Father and the Son, unto the fulfilling of the promise which he hath made, that if ye entered in by the way ye should receive. That's 2 Nephi 31 verse 17. Modern Revelation confirms what the Bible and Book of Mormon tell us about the straight gate. It also reiterates what the new and everlasting covenant really is and reminds us that the carnal commandments of the law of Moses, like polygamy, are done away with. Quote, Behold, I say unto you that all old covenants I have caused to be done away in this thing. And this is a new and everlasting covenant, even that which was from the beginning. Wherefore, although a man should be baptized a hundred times, it availeth in nothing. For you cannot enter in at the straight gate by the law of Moses, neither by your dead works. For it is because of your dead works that I have caused this last covenant and this church to be built up unto me, even as in the last days of old. Wherefore, enter ye in at the gate, as I have commanded, and seek not to counsel your God. Amen. End of quote. Section 132 is telling us that we get into the straight gate by multiple wives instead of by the baptism of water, fire, and the Holy Ghost. Are you willing to bet your salvation on this other gospel? All right, verse 25 of section 132 in black. Broad is the gate and wide the way that leadeth to the deaths, and many there be that go in thereat, because they receive me not, neither do they abide by my law. Uh, response by Watcher in red. Again, this is the second part of the phrase we've already researched. It just doesn't square with God's holy and fallible word of the scriptures. Okay, in black, section 132, verse 26. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man marry a wife according to my word, and they are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise according to mine appointment, and he or she shall commit any sin or transgression of the new and everlasting covenant, whatever, and all manner of blasphemies, and if they commit no murder wherein they shed innocent blood, yet they shall come forth in the first resurrection, and enter into their exaltation. But they shall be destroyed in the flesh, and shall be delivered unto the buffetings of Satan, unto the day of redemption, saith the Lord God. Response by Watcher in Red What an interesting doctrine! We talk about the insidious doctrine of works that overrides the grace of God through the atonement pursuant to the saving ordinances of the gospel, but this really takes the cake. According to this enlightened, quote-unquote, bit of legislation, if a man is sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, as long as he does not shed innocent blood, he can commit any sin or transgression and all manner of blasphemies and still be guaranteed exaltation in the highest kingdom after he gets his hands slapped for a while? The above doctrine in section 132 reminds me of the prophetic warning in the Book of Mormon that says in the last days men will be saying, quote, God will beat us with a few stripes and at last we shall be saved in the kingdom of God. Yea, and there shall be many which shall teach after this manner, false and vain and foolish doctrines, and shall be puffed up in their hearts, and shall seek deep to hide their counsels from the Lord, and their works shall be in the dark. O oh, the wise and the learned and the rich, that are puffed up in the pride of their hearts, and all those who preach false doctrines, and all those who commit whoredoms, and pervert the right way of the Lord, woe, woe, woe be unto them, saith the Lord God Almighty, for they shall be thrust down to hell. Second Nephi 28 verse 8. Are you buying what section 132 is selling? Or are you sticking with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are the above passages in section 132 preaching the simple and pure doctrine of Christ? Or is it teaching a vain and foolish doctrine that justifies people in committing whoredoms? Try reconciling the above passages in section 132 with the gospel of Jesus Christ that's taught in section 42 and the rest of the scriptures. Try reconciling it with section 76. 
Of course, in the passage above in section 132, we don't know which, quote, new and everlasting covenant, end of quote, it is speaking about, but it doesn't make any sense either way. Having gotten that little rant out of the way, let me suggest that verse 26 is perhaps one of the most blatant doctrinal slip-ups from those that crafted this revelation. If you'll do a keyword search for delivered unto the buffetings of Satan, you'll find that this phrase only shows up in modern revelation. It showed up in three, distinct, dis, three separate revelations before section 132 was crafted. Every one of the other three passages reveals that it is breaking the law of consecration that turns a person over to the buffetings of Satan. Furthermore, and perhaps even more telling, the scriptures are clear about the fact that everyone that dies is either sealed up to go to the spirit paradise because of their faith and righteousness, or they are sealed up to go to the spirit prison to await the wrath of God because they died in their sins without repenting during probation. Never do the scriptures speak of those that come forth out of prison as being the elect of God. Those that go to the spirit prison because they died in their sins are not caught up to the cloud to meet Jesus during the first resurrection. Period. End of story. We therefore know beyond question that the above passage in associated doctrine is out of harmony with the gospel that is revealed in the true revelations. It is after they have all suffered for their own sins in their flesh that the terrestrial and telestial spirits will receive their final resurrected bodies and eternal inheritances. Section 132, verse 27. The blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, which shall not be forgiven in the world nor in, out of the world, is in that ye commit murder wherein ye shed innocent blood and assent unto my death, after ye have received my new and everlasting covenant, saith the Lord God. And he that abideth not this law can in no wise enter into my glory, but shall be damned, saith the Lord. End of quote. Uh, now by Watcher in red. We've already discussed the absurdity of the doctrine that you are damned from entering into the glory of the Lord if you haven't enslaved a bunch of wives. We shan't belabor it. Okay, verse 28 in section 132 in black. I am the Lord thy God, and will give unto thee the law of my holy priesthood, as was ordained by me and my father before the world was. End of quote. Response by Watcher in red. As subtle as it is, this, of course, is the redefining of the oath and covenant of the Father, as mentioned in section 84, which is commonly referred to the church as the oath and covenant of the priesthood. In a previous article, I have shown beyond dispute that the oath and covenant of the Father pertains to the new and everlasting covenant of baptism. It is the baptismal covenant that enabled Father Adam and all of the great prophets and patriarchs to enter into the highest priesthood. Of course, now that this revelation is questionable, origin has redefined the term new and everlasting covenant to mean multiple wives, everything has changed, and we now have, quote, another gospel, end of quote. We can now focus on obtaining additional wives instead of focusing on the baptism of water, fire, and the Holy Ghost. In JST Luke 11:53. The Savior makes an astonishing accusation towards the religious lawyers that were largely responsible for teaching doctrine to, in the corrupt Jewish church. Quote, Woe unto you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge, the fullness of the scriptures. You have entered not in yourselves into the kingdom, and those who are entering in, you have hindered. End of quote. It is, is it possible that the other gospel contained in section 132 hinders people from entering into the kingdom by obscuring and redefining the true doctrines and ordinances contained in the four standard works? Perhaps when the fullness of the scriptures are made available, when the first laborers of the last kingdom return, it will be much clearer to us that the first gospel that was revealed through the prophet Joseph Smith was true. Verse 29 in section 132 in black. Abraham received all things. Whatsoever he received, by revelation and commandment, by my word, saith the Lord, and hath entered into his exaltation, and sitteth upon his throne. Abraham received promises concerning his seed, and of the fruit of his loins, from whose loins are ye, ye are, namely, my servant Joseph, which were to continue so long as they were in the world, and as touching Abraham and his seed. Out of the world they should continue, both in the world and out of the world should they continue, as innumerable as the stars, or, if you were to count the sand upon the seashore, you could not number them. 
uh, continuing on in verse 31. This promise is yours also because you are of Abraham. And the promise was made unto Abraham. And by this law is the continuation of the works of my father, wherein he glorified himself. Verse 32. Go ye therefore and do the works of Abraham. Enter ye into my law, and ye shall be saved. End of quote. A response by Watcher in red. I agree that we need to do the works of Abraham. What exactly did Abraham do that will enable us to become saved? He paid tithes to Melchizedek. That means he entered into the law of the gospel and consecration. In order to do that, he had to do what Melchizedek, Enoch, and Adam all did. He had to enter into the everlasting covenant of baptism, even the baptism of water, fire, and the Holy Ghost. After being baptized, he kept his oath to serve God, which is to be willing to sacrifice all things. After being baptized, he kept his oath to serve God, which is to be willing to sacrifice all things. Oh, I just read that, sorry. Those are the works of Abraham that we are supposed to follow. If this is a true revelation, how could God have overlooked including this information under the topic of, quote, do the works of Abraham, end of quote. Verse 33 in 132 in black. But if ye enter not into my law, ye cannot receive the promise of my father, which he made unto Abraham, end of quote. Uh, response by Watcher in Red. Here we have another redefining of what God's law is. In sections 37, 38, and 39, the Lord had commanded the saints to go to the Ohio where he would give them his law. Once they got to the Ohio, he gave them his law as contained in section 42. That is, the law of the gospel. In that section, the Lord said, Again, I say unto you, Hearken and hear and obey the law which I shall give unto you. End of quote. He then made specific mention of several laws, including the law of having only one wife. Eventually, the revelation stated that, quote, Thou shalt take the things which thou hast received, which have been given unto thee in my scriptures for a law, to be my law to govern my church. End of quote. Of course, the four standard works up to that period of time had all taught that the saints should have only one wife. Now, however, this revelation is redefining the law of the gospel that was given in section 42. This is a huge contradiction, and it appears to be redefining previous definitions of sacred laws that the Lord had already given to the saints. Is this not preaching another gospel than that found in the New Testament Book of Mormon and D&C? Okay, now again in section 132, verse 34. God commanded Abraham and Sarah gave Hagar to Abraham to wife. And why did she do it? Because this was the law. And from Hagar sprang many people. This, therefore, was fulfilling, among other things, the promises. End of quote. A response by Watcher in red. The scriptures support the, presupposition, the proposition that Sarah gave Hagar to Abraham and that God tolerated the patriarchal law of plural wives as practiced in Old Testament times. However, they don't indicate that God gave Hagar to Abraham by revelation, and they certainly don't indicate that the biblical law of polygamy was a celestial principle that would continue on into eternity. We need to remember that the children of Israel who were rejected the higher law and were living the law of carnal commandments were living polygamy. Many pro-polygamists will tell you that the children of polygamist wives are of a higher spiritual realm. However, the scriptures don't confirm this. Isaiah informs so that the righteous only come from Sarah, not Hagar. Check out Isaiah 51. It's also in the New Testament. Oh, furthermore, we... Paul informs us in Galatians 4 that Abraham had two sons, one from a bondwoman, Hagar, and one from a free woman, Sarah. He then informs us that those children from the free woman are the children of the promise, while those of the bondwoman are born after the flesh and are born unto bondage. The offspring of polygamous union from Abraham appear to be terrestrial spirits at best. Uh, back to section 132, starting in verse 35. Was Abraham therefore under condemnation? Verily I say unto you, Nay, for I the Lord commanded it. Abraham was commanded to offer his son Isaac. Nevertheless, it was written, Thou shalt not kill. Abraham, however, did not refuse, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Verse 37, Abraham received concubines, and they bore him children, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness, because they were given unto him, and he abode in my law, as Isaac also and Jacob did none other things than that which they were commanded. And because they did none other things than that which they were commanded, they have entered into their exaltation according to the promise, and sit upon thrones 
and are not angels, but are gods. Okay, response by Watcher in red. Stating that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have received their exaltation are now gods sitting on their thrones is simply not congruent with the scriptures and its false doctrine. Paraphrasing a scripture in Hebrews, the prophet Joseph Smith made the following comment found in section 128, quote, as Paul says concerning the fathers, that they without us cannot be made perfect, neither can we without our dead be made perfect, end of quote. That's in DNC 128. Abraham has been redeemed from this telestial world, but he has not been made perfect. He can't be made perfect until the righteous from our dispensation have been made perfect. Father Abraham and others have been redeemed from the powers of this world, but they have not redeemed, received their final salvation parentheses exaltation question mark and been made perfect yet in fact god hasn't even completed his covenant with abraham and jacob and the other patriarchal fathers yet please note the following passages quote your dwelling shall become desolate until the time of the fulfilling of the covenant of your fathers end of quote and that's in third nephi Quote, and when the day cometh that the wrath of God is poured out upon the mother of harlots, which is the great and abominable church of all the earth, whose founder is the devil, then at that day the work of the Father shall commence in preparing the way for the fulfilling of his covenants, which he hath made to his people, who are of the house of Israel. End of quote. And that's in 1 Nephi 14. Quote, Wherefore our Father hath not spoken of our seed alone, but also of all the house of Israel, pointing to the covenant, which should be fulfilled in the latter days, which covenant the Lord made to our father Abraham, saying, In thy seed shall all the kindred of the earth be blessed. First Nephi. Quote, Nevertheless, when that day comes, saith the prophet, that they no more turn aside their hearts against the Holy One of Israel, then will he remember the covenants which he made to their fathers. That's in First Nephi. Why don't we wait until the covenant between God and Abraham has been fulfilled before we try to exalt Abraham and send him off to create other worlds? Okay, in uh, section 132, verse 38. David also received many wives and concubines, and also Solomon and Moses, my servants, as also many others of my servants, from the beginning of creation until this time, and in nothing did they sin, save in those things which they received not of me. Now, verse 39, David's wives and concubines were given unto him of me by the hand of Nathan, my servant, and others of the prophets who had the keys of this power. And in none of these things did he sin against me, save in the case of Uriah and his wife. And therefore he hath fallen from his exaltation and received his portion. And he shall not inherit them out of the world, for I gave them unto another, saith the Lord. Okay, this is the response by Watcher in Red. As pointed out after the very first passage of this revelation, the prophet Joseph Smith revealed to the world through the Book of Mormon that David was not justified in the taking of many wives and concubines. The case of Uriah was not the only case in which he sinned. Additionally, one could assume from the above passage that David did not sin in any other way than in the case of Uriah. That, of course, would not be accurate either, as David was prevented from building the temple because of the wars he had been involved in. Quote, and David said unto Solomon, My son, as for me, as was in my mind to build a house unto the name of the Lord my God, but the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thou hast shed blood abundantly, and hast made great wars. Thou shalt not build a house unto my name, because thou hast shed much blood upon the earth in my sight. That's JST 1 Chronicles 22.7. Okay, um, going back to section 132, verse 40. I am the Lord thy God, and I gave unto thee my servant Joseph an appointment, and restore all things. Ask what you will, and it shall be given unto you according to my word. And as ye have asked concerning adultery, verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man receiveth a wife in the new and everlasting covenant, and if she be with another man, and I have not appointed unto her by the holy anointing, she hath committed adultery, and shall be destroyed. If she be not in the new and everlasting covenant, and she be with another man, she has committed adultery. Verse 43, And if her husband be with another woman, and he was under a vow, he hath broken his vow, and hath committed adultery. And if she hath not committed adultery, but is innocent, and hath not broken her vow, and she knoweth it, and I reveal it unto you, my servant Joseph, then shall you have power, by the power of the holy priesthood, to take her and give her unto her, him that hath not committed adultery but hath been faithful, for he shall be made ruler over many. 
Verse 45, For I have conferred upon you the keys and the power of the priesthood, wherein I restore all things, and make known unto you all things in due time. And verily, verily, I say unto you that whatsoever you seal on earth shall be sealed in heaven, whatsoever you bind on earth in my name, and it by my word, saith the Lord, it shall be eternally bound in the heavens, and whosoever sins you remit on earth shall be remitted eternally in the heavens, and whosoever sins you retain on earth shall be retained in heaven. Verse 47, And again, verily I say, Whomsoever you bless, I will bless, and whomsoever you curse, I will curse, saith the Lord, for I, the Lord, am thy God. Verse 48, And again, verily I say unto you, my servant Joseph, that whatsoever you give on earth, and, and to whomsoever you give any one on earth, by my word and according to my law, it shall be visited with blessings and not cursings, and with my power, saith the Lord, and shall be without condemnation on earth and in heaven. Verse 49, For I am the Lord thy God, and will be with thee unto the end of the world, and through all eternity, for verily I seal upon you your exaltation, and prepare a throne for you in the kingdom of my father, and Abraham your father. Uh, in red, response by watcher. The, impl the implication from this verse is that even after exaltation, the patriarchal order within this mortality continues on. Abraham continues to be Joseph Smith's patriarchal father in the celestial kingdom. This seems inconsistent with previous scriptures that indicate that after the saints are redeemed, all are equal with each other, even with Christ. Quote, and again, another angel shall sound his trump, which is the seventh angel, saying, It is finished, it is finished. The Lamb of God hath overcome and trodden the winepress alone, even the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And then shall the angels be crowned with the glory of his might. And then shall, and then, and the saints shall be filled with his glory, and receive their inheritance be made equal with him. Section 88. Uh, back to section 132, verse 50. Behold, I've seen your sacrifices, and I will forgive all your sins. I've seen your sacrifices in obedience to that which I have told you. Go therefore, and I make a way for your escape, as I accepted the offerings of Abraham of his son Isaac. 51. Verily I say unto you, a commandment I give unto you, my handmaid, Emma Smith, your wife, whom I have given unto you, that she stay herself and partake not of that which I commanded you to offer unto her. For I did it, saith the Lord, to prove you all, as I did Abraham, that I might require an offering at your hand by covenant and sacrifice. A response by Watcher in Red. It seems like a poor analogy to compare a commandment from the Lord offering other husbands to Emma to the commandment of the Lord for Abraham to sacrifice his only son. The historicity behind this very strange verse appears to be the situation where Joseph was trying to pacify the jealousy of Emma towards her sister wives by offering to let her have other husbands. Pretty sick. But even if Emma wanted other husbands and would be pacified by having them, I hardly see that if anyone, if something that be, could be compared to the sacrifice of Abraham's only son. Further, the terms covenant and sacrifice are foundational terms pertaining to the great sacrifice of a broken heart and a contrite spirit that were commanded to offer up when we enter into the true and everlasting covenant. Again, this revelation is redefining existing gospel terms and preaching another gospel. Please note the following verses, which are all unified in revealing the true sacrifice and covenant that the Lord requires of us. Verse 8, Verily I say unto you, All among them who know their hearts are honest and are broken and their spirits contrite and are willing to observe their covenants by sacrifice, yea, Every sacrifice which I, the Lord, shall command, they are accepted of me. For I, the Lord, will cause them to bring forth as a very fruitful tree, which is planted in a goodly land by a pure stream, that yieldeth much precious fruit. Verily I say unto you, that it is my will that a house should be built unto me in the land of Zion, like unto the pattern which I have given you. Yea, let it be built speedily by the tithing of my people. Behold, this is the tithing and the sacrifice which I, the Lord, will require at their hands, that there may be a house built unto me for the salvation of Zion. Clearly, the sacrifice and covenant spoken of here in the scriptures is different from what section 132 is referring to. 
uh, section 132, verse 52. And let my handmaid Emma Smith receive all those who have been given unto my servant Joseph, and who are virtuous and pure before me, and those who are not pure, and have said they were pure, shall be destroyed, saith the Lord God. For I am the Lord God, and ye shall obey my voice. And I give unto my servant Joseph, that he shall be made ruler over many things, for he hath been faithful over a few things, and from henceforth I'll strengthen him. And I command my handmaid Emma Smith to abide and to cleave unto my servant Joseph, and to none else. But if she will not abide this commandment, she shall be destroyed, saith the Lord. For I am the Lord thy God, and will destroy her if she abide not in my law. A response by Watcher and read, I find it very interesting that the Lord is threatening to destroy Emma if she doesn't follow his commandment. In other parts of this revelation, being destroyed in the flesh corresponds with being turned over to the buffetings of Satan. That phrase shows up four times in modern revelation. The first three times is always has to do with those who break the law of consecration that they've entered into. Yet this revelation would have us believe that it pertains to rejecting polygamy. Again, we're redefining the use of this term from the sacred law of consecration to personal, to pertain to a different law of multiple wives, which is a carnal commandment. Please notice the following verses. D&C 78 verse 12. And he who breaketh it shall lose his office in standing in the church and shall be delivered over to the buffetings of Satan until the day of redemption. D&C 82:21. And the soul that sins against this covenant and hardeneth his heart against it shall be dealt with according to the laws of my church, shall be delivered over the buffetings of Satan until the day of redemption. D&C 104, verses 9 and 10. Inasmuch as ye are cut off for transgression, ye cannot escape the buffetings of Satan until the day of redemption. And I now give unto you power from this very hour, that if any man among you of the order is found a transgressor and repenteth not of the evil, that ye shall deliver him over unto the buffetings of Satan, and he shall not have power to bring evil upon you. By the way, do you find it just a little strange how the Lord pummels us with warnings about living consecration all throughout the DNC until this revelation? Then it's not even mentioned. Very strange. All right, 132 verse 55. But if she will not abide this commandment, then shall my servant Joseph do all things for her, even as he hath said. And I will bless him and multiply him and give unto him an hundredfold in this world of fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters, houses and lands, wives and children, and crowns of eternal lives in the eternal worlds. And again, verily I say, let my handmaid forgive my servant Joseph his trespasses, and then shall she be forgiven her trespasses, wherein she has trespassed against me. And I, the Lord God, will bless her and multiply her and make her heart to rejoice. And again, I say, let not my servant Joseph put his property out of his hands, lest an enemy come and destroy him, for Satan seeketh to destroy. For I am the Lord thy God, and he is my servant. And behold, and lo, I am with him, as I was with Abraham thy father, even unto his exaltation and glory. Now as touching the law of the priesthood, there are many things pertaining thereunto. Verse 59. Verily, if a man be called of my father, as was Aaron, by mine own voice, and by the voice of him that sent me, and I have endowed him with the keys of the power of this priesthood, if he will do anything in my name, and according to my law and my word, he will not commit sin, and I will justify him. Let no one therefore set on my servant Joseph, for I will justify him, for he shall do the sacrifice which I required his hands, for his transgression, saith the Lord your God. Verse 61, and again, as pertaining to the law of the priesthood, if any man espouse a virgin, and desire to espouse another, and the first giver consent, and if he espouse the second, and they are virgins, and have vowed to know their man, then is he justified. He cannot commit adultery, for they are given unto him, for he cannot commit adultery with that that belongeth unto him and to no one else. Verse 62, And if he have ten virgins given unto him by this law, he cannot commit adultery, for they belong to him. And they are given unto him, therefore he's justified. But if one or other, either of the ten virgins, after she's espoused, shall be with another man, she has committed adultery, and shall be destroyed. For they are given unto him to multiply and replenish the earth, according to my commandment, and to fulfill the promise which was given by my father. 
uh, before the foundation of the world and for their exaltation in the eternal worlds that they may bear the souls of men for herein is the work of my father continued that he may be glorified end of quote response by watcher this spiritual wife law contained in this revelation appears to apply only to virgins this is of course is totally inconsistent with the actions of joseph smith's according to the claim of multiple historians who claim to have provided significant documentation showing that the majority of women that Joseph Smith took as wives had been or currently were married to other men. One of the biggest problems with the credibility of this um, revelation is that Joseph Smith did not seem to honor the terms and conditions laid out in this revelation. Additionally, according to the testimony of William Law, the original version of the revelation Okay, this is going to be part one. Part two will be coming up.